Double Double, Toil and Trouble, Fire Burn and Cauldron Bubble. Cool it with Analog IP. No, that's not right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com, hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton, with a big old shout out to the one and only William Shakespeare. So this week, my friends, what we have is a bubbling virtual witch's brew of electronic engineering creativity that is one part analog, three parts IP, with a big old heaping spoonful of intelligent decision making. So, all witchiness aside, what we're really talking about today is a holistic approach to hardware-based SOC and ASIC cybersecurity. So, without further ado, please welcome Gajinder Panesar from Ultra SOC and Tim Ramsdale from Agile Analog. Gaj, Tim, and I are discussing what Ultra SOC's digital monitoring ecosystem IP is all about, the changing role of analog IP in the world of cybersecurity, and why this new collaboration between Ultra SOC and Agile Analog will help enable a holistic approach to hardware-based SOC and ASIC cybersecurity. All right, let's go. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, so first off, for my audience who may not know, what is UltraSoc all about? Well, what we do is we address the, the key problem, which is it's about the system. It's not about one particular component in a system. We provide visibility, and with that visibility, you can do a whole bunch of things, and I'm sure we'll talk about that shortly. The visibility is system-wide, and this is system in the sense both hardware and software and the visibility can be used as i said in a number of ways ranging from things like classic debug to monitoring and optimization to safety and security okay so you guys are collaborating with agile analog to enable a holistic approach to hardware based soc and asic cybersecurity with your digital monitoring ecosystem IP. So first off, let's talk about that holistic approach. Now, guys, what exactly do you guys mean by that? Okay, so let me step back a bit and, and ex sort of explain the infrastructure, the, the system that Ultrasoc has. What we do is we have a bunch of smart monitors that can be configured at runtime to look for certain conditions, report certain conditions, report data, and cross trigger from one monitor to another monitor. Well, that data will then get transferred onto a layer of IP modules, and these modules build up a message passing fabric. So this means that any data that the modules generate do not affect the target system's behavior because it has its own transport mechanism. And then the data that's on the transport message passing fabric then ultimately goes to some communicators. The communicators are, are our third layer within our infrastructure. And these communicators talk with the Ultrasoc world and another world. So, for example, the other world could be off-chip or it could be to some entity on-chip which is sitting there monitoring, looking for this information to see whether there's some outliers or some breach of security or there's some safety issue going on. Those three layers tend to be completely non-intrusive and recently we have now added a, a fourth layer which are active managers and these active managers are necessary for certain class of systems for example high integrity systems where just reporting some event is anomalous that reporting isn't good enough you actually want to prevent that anomalous behavior from actually happening because if you don't you know you'll hit the wall or you'll knock down some pedestrian or something so what we mean by the holistic system is that we have this coherent infrastructure on to which we can attach introspective probes, monitors that do not affect behavior or have more active managers in one layer. And that programming and visibility of the data coming off is coherent. That's what we mean by holistic. It's not just about one portion of the system, but the whole system we provide this coherent infrastructure in place. 
So, Gaj, let's dive into your digital monitoring ecosystem IP a little bit more. Now, what does it really buy me as an engineer? That's a good question. And a lot of people have been doing some of the stuff that the non-intrusive monitors provide. They've been doing it in, in an ad hoc way for many years. Uh, some engineer in the past would have gone, oh, I want to be able to look at this. And they'll create some widget and then they find that widget doesn't scale when the next chip comes along. So what does it buy? So let's think about a Sysmon chip which has a bunch of CPUs in it, one or more DRAM controllers, I.O., Ethernet, USB 3, hardware accelerator, security engines, and the like. So at one level, when it comes to things like observing for performance, what we can do is ask questions like, why am I not seeing the MIPS or the compute power that I'm supposed to have with my latest and greatest CPU? With some of these monitors, we can actually drill down and see for example, the reason why this performance isn't being met is because, for example, you're seeing lots of iCache misses when you shouldn't be seeing iCache misses. The reason for that may be because the branch predictor or system software running on that CPU isn't predicting well enough. So you can provide better hints and provide less misses to the system, which means the whole system will behave better. Another case would be, say, you have a, a, an SOC with a knock. It's a coherent knock where data is shared in a coherent manner amongst a number of cores. The CPUs themselves are running what they think should be running. There's no caches missing, cache misses going on. But actually what's going on under the hood is the knock is sending out lots of snoop requests from one CPU to another, and that's what's causing the degradation in performance because the bottleneck now becomes the knock and not the CPUs. So that's about performance. If we look at it, say, for the high integrity systems, we can look for things like data. We can analyze data as it's coming off, say, a camera before it gets into memory, and that analysis of the data before it hits the memory, we can run a bunch of anomaly detection algorithms before the application stack can start looking at it in memory. And this means we can do the analysis in microseconds as opposed to hundreds of milliseconds. If you're driving a car at several tens of miles per hour, that computes to quite a distance. Okay, so let's bring in Tim Ramsdale from Agile Analog. So first, Tim, um, what is Agile Analog all about? Thanks, Amelia. So we're a, a UK company who deliver analog IP. So every SOC, even the ones that everyone think are purely digital, everyone needs analog IP because there are always power supplies to drive, clocks to generate, and sensors to, to measure. So fundamentally, we're about all of those analog components that you build into your SOC. Our approach is, is unique in that although we sell IP, we have in-house a set of recipes and a tool that allows us to generate this IP individually for every single customer. So we develop that IP for a specific customer specification on their process um, to fit in with their time scale. So, you know, it's like you get custom IP, but with a, a time scale as if it were off the shelf. Now, your sensors are being used to monitor side channel attacks in this collaboration with, with UltraSock. So tell me a little bit about that. Yes, so Gadge has given you a great overview of UltraSock. And one of the things that, that we found um, really appealing in, in working together is the fact that they have this architecture to be able to bring all of this data to a single place. When you look at any product connected to the internet, today. Cybersecurity is, is a really big concern that I think everyone is talking about at the moment. We're becoming increasingly aware of our data and the implications of attacks. The attacks that we look at are, again, the attacks on the periphery of the, of the chip predominantly, so physical level attacks. So things we look at are voltage style attacks, clock attacks and temperature attacks. These are ways you can physically interfere with the chip in order to try and defeat any cybersecurity protection that has been built in. 
And we've seen some really good examples, even in the last few months, of people hacking some really well-known SOCs to be able to get at protected information, be that keys, be that accessing networks, or even just being able to download the code base from a commonly used product. So... Tim, let's talk a little bit about the role of analog IP overall in cybersecurity. Where do you see agile analog fitting into this picture going forward? That's a great question, Amelia. And when I look at a lot of the cybersecurity attacks that are happening at the moment, the ones that are most publicized uh, are actually either the network level attacks or the software style attacks. So these are people who've developed products and they've left the root password available with a default password that you can easily hack. They've left ports open on their systems that you can access. And so, you know, essentially there are attacks that you can deliver just using a keyboard and a Wi-Fi connection quite often. And I guess I, I look at those sorts of attacks like you, you've left your front door wide open, right? You know, no one bothered trying the window if the front door has been left wide open. When we look at these physical level of attacks, these are, are things that do require more, more attention, but often you only need $100 worth of kit to be able to do some of these attacks. And so, you know, once people have patched the obvious issues in these IoT products, so they've closed down the ports, they haven't delivered products with root passwords still enabled, the next level of attack is going to be the physical level attacks where, where people try and get more information from a product so that they can try and find exploits that they can, can take advantage of. The difference between these two is that to address these physical attacks, you actually need to make substantial changes to your SOC. You need to include the sorts of technology that Gadge and I have been talking about to detect those sorts of attacks. And you can't just patch them in software. We see this as a really crucial part of any cybersecurity solution and one that over the, the next few years is going to it more and more interest and more and more traction. Touching on one other thing Gadge said, though, that I think is really important is that alongside cybersecurity, there is this system monitoring piece, which Gadge gave the excellent example of automotive. In the automotive environment, Yes, there are cybersecurity style attacks, but there are also, you know, aging effects and other behaviors, component failures that can occur. And, you know, just as the ultrasoc technology is able to discover anomalies, the analog technology can also discover anomalies. If a clock is operating too fast, if a voltage has started to droop, then these things can be discovered. And, and the beautiful thing about us working together is all of this data can be collated in a single system controller. As Gadge said, it's, it's communicated outside of the normal networking infrastructure on the, on the chip. And so it's gathered in a single place. And that that system can then make decisions not based on one sensor or two sensors, but all of the data that it has of that on that chip as to what is going wrong and what should be done about it. So let's bring in Gash from Ultrasock again here. Now, tell me a little bit more about why you think the collaboration between Agile Analog and Ultrasock in this particular arena is so powerful. Sure. It's about systemic complexity. So as systems become more and more complex, that there is more things that can go wrong. There is more things that people can exploit. And as, as Tim's just said, things wear and people can exploit the fact things wear and tear. So having this monitoring system with the analog monitors feeding data into a coherent infrastructure or coherent architecture means that the analysis can be done as close to the hardware as possible. So, for example, we can take in the data coming from the analog monitors and observe the patterns that these, these set of monitors generate in conjunction with the data that our digital monitors generate. And we can then correlate the patterns with known good patterns or bad patterns. Or when we see patterns distorting, that's when we know things are going wrong, either 
through bugs or some safety issues or there's some bad guy out there. And it's this complexity that I think Tim touched on it, that you could probably fix those problems that you know about now, but in two, three, four years' time, those things will morph. They'll change into different areas. So I think understanding in the field and observing and making decisions in the field for things have changed. And sometimes those things have changed and you know they're catastrophic and you, you take appropriate action. Or sometimes you go, this is weird. I, I'm not quite sure what's going on. I need some higher entity. In which case, at some point, that information will be uploaded to some sort of cloud or some human intervention. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now let's bring in Tim for one last bit for this. So what do you think is the power of the collaboration between these two companies? For me, data is everything. And I think the, the beauty of this collaboration is the fact that we both bring really strong, strong contributions with relatively ov little overlap. And working together, we're able to, to deliver real value to our end customers. You know, I, I think there are a huge number of, of customers out there in the industry who all are seeing these types of issues and the ability to bring them this, this level of monitoring, this level of data, which they can see uses for today for cybersecurity and for monitoring. But you know, as Gadge says, over time, I think this will just grow and grow and grow in terms of the the amount of analysis you can do. And the thing that we talk about a lot is the, the intelligence of the decision making. When you just see your voltage droop, when you just see the temperature change dramatically, so analog measurements, it's very difficult with that alone to say, what should we do about this? And, you know, a lot of system controllers today, they have to make black or white decisions. You know, I'm going to shut down because something's gone wrong. And I think, you know, the, the beauty of the two companies working together is that you can make much more intelligent decisions based on the breadth of the data that you've got. The idea that in the instant, and as Gadge says, extremely quickly, you're able to make decisions about what you're going to do about the, the data that you've received, you know, is crucial in, in every market. You know, automotive, you can see how crucial it is. But even in the IoT space, there's some great papers that are out there at the moment, which say some of these hacks, they had a window of a couple of hundred milliseconds where a hack was possible. And that was all they needed. And so being able to address these things really quickly is, is actually going to be really crucial going forwards. Excellent. Well, guys, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Tim. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting us on, Amelia. And thank you very much, guys, for joining me. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. It's been very interesting. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And don't forget, if you want to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, well, sure, you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by, yeah, me. <laughs> also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Fry and page, you can check out the Fish Fry archive. Lots of really good stuff in there. Or subscribe to Fish Fry via Podbean, Spotify, or the iTunes store. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology and you'd love to talk to me about it, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on eejournal. For the week of May 29th, 2020, I'm Amelia Dalton. And you've been fried.